Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for joining us here for another edition of Run It Back. I'm joined today by the champ himself, Mr. Phil Helmuth, on the show today. Phil, I'm so excited that we were able to do this on such short notice after your three-in-a-row wins versus Mr. Daniel Negrano, your good friend. You guys had a lot of banter. You guys had a lot of back and forth. There were some some tough times. Some harsh words were said along over the course of these three matches. Uh, but I'm super excited that um, you know I can I can have you here now to you know break it all down for us. You know, let us know how it feels to beat Negrano three in a row. Uh, so first and foremost, let's start with that. How does it feel to get to three in a row? Well, it's nice because it's a cash out button, right? So you win the first one, and you're like great. You win the second one, and you're like great. But you don't win the third one, you don't get anything. If I lost the third one, I put up 50K. So then, you know, then I won that. So now I have 100. Now he matches it with 100. And then I won that. So now I have 200. Or Yeah, and then and he has to match that with 200. But if I lose that match, then I'm down 50,000. And if I win it, I'm up 350. It's a lot of money to play for. And so, you know, and so, yeah, uh, I couldn't wait to hit the cash out window. I'm like, done, next opponent. And, you know, I mean, maybe the next match will probably be for 50 or 100 against, you know, it could be Tom Dwan, could be Phil Ivey. Um, you know, there's some other possibilities out there. And uh, and we'll see what that looks like. Were there more nerves last night uh, knowing that this was like the cash out round for you? Um, you know, it was really weird. I, I had more nerves uh, going into the second round. And uh, believe it or not, and, you know, this round, I mean, listen, you know, I mean, I, I put up, I had 200,000 at risk, but actually 190, um, <clears throat> one person has had 5,000 of me in every match and, uh, and, and reduce their position each time to just keep five. So that person's up like, <laughs> you know, 30,000, I've won six in a row, or maybe once they kept 10 out there. And uh, so, you know, um, and I sold 5,000 to Ustake, the Ustake.com fans. I've made those guys 200,000 at Ustake. I've won 20 out of 21 packages, broke even in one other. And, you know, all these markup police can, <laughs> they think I'm charging a lot for markup. How about when you went 20 out of 21 times, you know, <laughs> markup, please. <laughs> Uh, it, it was it was definitely a special night last night. Um, in the beginning, you guys were having some fun, you know, chirping back and forth a little bit, and then all of a sudden, the match got more and more serious. You got quieter. You, I saw you pacing around the room maybe once or twice, but that was nothing compared to the first two matches where your emotions seemed to be much higher and lower. Why were you so calm last night? Um. I mean, we're playing for a lot. I mean, I can't afford, I can't afford to do anything, right? I can't afford to get too emotional. I can't afford to, to, to get too high or, or too low. I can't afford to like, like every ounce of energy had to be focused on that match. Now I like smiling. I like laughing. And I think I can do that and maintain a high focus, but uh, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, there's a, the, the Kings versus Kings hands, which we'll get to in a little while. That was, you know, kind of shocking to the system a little bit. Um, but, you know, I had already prepared to lose that hand uh, after I saw the flop. So I already had the chips counted and ready and just pushed them over. I mean, right now here, we're, we're getting into the first big moment of the stream. P people on Twitter were falling all over themselves to, to have an opinion on this hand. You limp in on the button with the ace jack. Walk us through your thought process here. How did you end up folding? Well, I limped in with Ace Jack, and there were several combinations. How much did he make it here? Uh, 2,800. Yeah. And I had 400 in there, yeah. So pause it if you want. Yeah, will do. And I'm sitting there, and I just knew that Daniel was making these 7X raises. Okay. Now, 7 to 10X, whatever. 
He's making these raises to kind of try to exploit, but I'm a master at exploiting. And I knew the first time he made a seven X, I called with King ton of diamonds because I thought he didn't have anything. And so that was a great call. How then an hour later, do you explain that I then fold ace, jack of spades and yet called with King ton of diamonds to anyone that's smart at all. They know that I had a read a great read. So when I called with the King ton of diamonds, I felt like I was pretty unlucky that hand. I felt like, I felt like I'm supposed to win that pot and go up 10, 15, 20,000 in the match and just win the match because my reads were so dead on. Right. And so to, to fold the King, to call with the King 10 and fold the ace Jack. Now, I don't think in the history of poker, we've ever seen anyone fold ace Jack of spades in a heads up match before the flop. I don't think it's ever happened. Now, maybe if, if, you know, especially just for one race, even though it was a big race, pretty sure that's the case. So, you know, you're talking for seen someone fold ace jack of spades before. Now, so there's two things going on here for that. One, my read. And two, the meta game. And the meta game, the game within the game, so to speak, was I knew once I called him with king ten of diamonds, I knew that he was going to wait until he was super strong before he did it again. So logic dictated my meta game. My read on Daniel is he's going to wait until he's super strong before he pulls that move again. Uh, you can pause it. Yeah. And so I was, so I was expecting, and then as a lot of time passed, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour. And I'm like, and then when he finally did it again, I'm like, okay, he has it for sure. And then I read it. And I'm like, oh, my God, he has me dead here. And I just thought to myself, no one has ever seen this fold before. One of the folds that I will make sometimes, uh, you know, but not advertise. I mean, just in a World Series tournament, maybe I'll make a similar fold. I'll flip it face up. But the legend of the fold doesn't spread. A few people at the table are like, that was a bad play, Phil. And then we go to the next hand. And the other guy doesn't show his hand. And so, you know, and so actually the, the funny part is, so to me, um, you know, I just dodged a big bullet there, you know, now some people are like, well, you're so deep. You should try to make a flush. And, you know, a lot of people are, well, you're so deep. You should try to hit an ace and a jack, you know, and Daniel's a tough guy to bluff, man. And if it comes an ace, I don't know, I might lose 20, 25,000. It's going to be a huge swing. I just felt he had me. And so, you know, for those two reasons, meta game and my read, I folded. Yeah, beautiful fold here to kick off the match. Just want to let everyone know who is watching right now. Send in your questions for Phil. We are live on Twitch, on Facebook, and on YouTube. We're going to be here for the next 90 minutes. We're going to watch all the important hands from the match from last night. If you want to watch the entire match, it is all available on Poker Go. Use the promo code DUAL3 to take $20 off the annual sub if you're not, if you're not subscribed just yet. But please stay with us here for the next 90 minutes because Phil is going to share a lot of wisdom about Heads Up Play and about his match against Negranu. And maybe will pry some information out of him that will help you in your own game by the way don't forget to like this video subscribe to our channels that is all we ask for here on run it back we'll just dive straight back into the action uh as phil is just mixing it up here uh three betting here with the jack five offsuit is that also you know a read play you know i mean you can't always be right but you're, you're batting a pretty good number uh but this this felt right in the moment yeah this was a bad read you know i i admit it you know, I have I took a hand which I could easily fold, and uh, but you know, I'm the match before I I won I must have bluffed him 20 times at least by just putting in big re-raises, and so I just made a bad read. I didn't think he had it, right. and uh, he had it more than I thought actually. Yeah. So once he calls 5200, I think I give up quickly. I don't remember, but yeah, I think I just give up. You know, because now I'm sensing he has it right. And now I'm like, okay, you tried your move. Uh, let's see how well, how he acts on the flop. Right now, he's looking, he's looking. And I have to pay attention to exactly what he's doing. I pay attention to exactly how he throws in the chips. I pay attention to, you know, so I'm ready. I'm in defensive mode. I'm ready to give up, but I'm also ready to notice if something weird is in his giddy up. Like, maybe if he flops top set, I might sense something and make a bad raise. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe but maybe if he has like if i think he has nothing i'll send something and make a good race 
it's pretty rare that I that I you know get it wrong. Um, but you know, of course, we played a lot of hands, three hundred hands or something. Yeah, you guys played a really sort of drawn out match each and every single time. The matches were really long, I believe, you know, averaged about six hours. Was that part of your strategy to make sure that you weren't going to get into massive pots in the beginning? Yeah, I, I don't want to play big pots at the beginning, you know. And, uh, you know, here's a hand where I just, I turned it straight and I said, the only way I can get any value is if he bluffs the river. And, uh, you know, there's only 800 in there. And so, you know, uh, if I had bet, I just think he's going to fold. And so when he bets the river, I just kind of snap all in one pot. A small one, hardly worth showing that one. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, listen, Daniel started, I mean, he started on fire, right? I mean, literally, even the commentators who are definitely biased towards Daniel, and I like Ali, and I've hung out with Ali a lot. I mean, we go to dinner, we hang out, we drink, and I love Maria. Both those guys I love, actually. And so, all right, I'm eating the Starbucks fruit and nut mix. Um, a little bit of sugar in there, but a little bit of, uh, you know, by the way, those were all unrealistic stuff. I mean, like, put some real stuff up there. I felt like, felt like they could have done the Hellmuth Cafe better. Yeah, they I should agree. Have had, they should have had realistic things. Yeah, so you know, realistic like, things, I would have said, you know, there needs to always be a burger option on there, a candy option, and, and maybe, maybe some kind of, like, you know, chocolate bar. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, uh, I brought nutter butter cookies with me this time. I didn't end up eating any. I brought the, uh, you know, the, uh, of course, brought the Sour Patch Kids. Only had three Sour Patch Kids the whole match, I think. Um, and, you know, which is unusual. I think I had two oranges and a red. Um, I, I, I love the fact that the... The Phil, the Hel the Helmuth Cafe is becoming sort of a viral sensation, and everyone loves to chime in on it. Uh, but for the most part, you know, it's just you're just providing so much entertainment to us, and uh, we just we just appreciate it. Lots of questions coming in, by the way. People, uh, you know, take it easy. We'll get to your questions. There's a lot of things going on here, uh, and of course, we cannot uh, we cannot um, uh, move on from Helmuth Cafe that quickly. Uh, there's tons of things going on in the chat. So uh, before we get to that, Phil, I just want to I just, just want to ask you you win against Antonio three in a row. Then you win against Daniel three in a row. W what is left for you to prove here in this arena? Are you going to keep playing or are you going to say, you know, someone else can have my seat, you know, because I've shown that I can do it? No way. I'm not giving up. I mean, you know, I mean, listen, I mean, I think the next challenger is going to be a Tom Dwan or Phil Ivey, I think. And, uh, you know, I, I, I accepted challenges from both of them before the Daniel match. Daniel kind of jumped the line a little bit because he, he's just such great entertainment. He's such a great player. He's so much fun. And, uh, and, he's, and he generated so much press with his match against Doug Polk. So he kind of jumped the line. But I, I said yes to both those guys immediately. I have some choice who I play. They asked me to play Antonio. I said yes. They asked me to play Daniel. I said yes. And if they asked me to play Dwan or Ivy, I'm going to say yes. So you know, theoretically, I have some choice, but I'm probably not going to say no ever. Right. So this is an interesting hand here. So oh, Daniel, this is the this Daniel, is, in my opinion, this is the hand of the night, Phil. T take it away here. Take it away. Well, I was kind of you know, listen. I mean, Daniel's Daniel. Listen, the one thing that's undisputed that Daniel will tell you, and everybody will tell you, is he ran red hot to start this match. So he got me down, you know, forty, fifty thousand. Just he had it every time. It was crazy, and I seemed to have a lot of second bests. So and now I'm looking for my spots. Now I have to push because the cards aren't cooperating. So now I have to think outside the box. I like it when the cards are cooperating, but when they're not, you have to go for it sometimes. So, you know, I, I sensed he was a little weak and, uh, and I, I three bet him and then he, I give him credit. He, he four bet me with deuces to 13,000. That's a strong play, man. Very strong. And will win 99% of the time against people. Right. But I'm like, I'm like, screw this you know and i mean you could argue that daniel you know um so so i'm, I'm like i'm like you know what i'm going with my fucking read he's weak so i just went for it i'm like i make it thirty-five thousand. that should be enough for him to get rid of him i think and several pros i talked to think daniel should fold here because what are you trying to do hit a deuce like it's not like i mean there's there's nothing if you assume i'm great at reading you can just kind of like he's dominating the match. He's been super lucky. He has, you know, if he folds here, big deal. He lost 13,000. He still has a ton of chips. He still has a dominating position in this match, a really good position. And he's going to have great momentum. 
I don't like this call here, 22,000 more. Um, I mean, of course, seeing that I had eight, three fine, but I mean, like, I'd much rather see him raise. So in this know, situation um, here, you, you put in, you put in the five bet with the eight, three suited when Daniel calls, what are you then thinking? Because clearly, you know, that should indicate that he has at least something. Are you thinking I'm just going to play this as if I have aces and just keep firing? No, I, I, I'm thinking he's weak. I'm thinking he's really weak. Um, and actually, you know, so I, there's, I mean, I, I five bet the spot. I'm not, I didn't five bet to fold. So I went for the early quick check and, uh, and now he's studying. And now as I'm kind of sensing, he has nothing. So just run it at regular speed. I'm sensing he's weak and the way he grabs his chips, the amount he bets, I'm thinking, okay, he's pretty weak here. And I actually snap call 21,000, which must've, I thought, yeah, I snap call 20, which I thought must've shocked the whole world. Right. It did. What is Phil doing? <laughs> and I'm thinking the only reason I didn't raise on the flop is because I think if he has King queen, I don't want him to move in and I have to fold. So now a blank comes off. Now I think I can bluff ace king or ace queen off the hand. I think I can bluff eights or nines off the hand. And I'm thinking he might have two nines actually is one of my, you know, and I'm like, you know, fuck it. I'm going for it. You know, nines can't beat anything right now. So, and I turned a flush draw too, but I'm pretty sure I'm betting every turn unless an eight comes. I if mean, an eight comes, I might check. You, you uh, have, or if a three comes, I might check. You have the majority of your stack committed right now with an eight high flush draw on the turn. It's just, it's just riveting stuff. I was like nailed to my seat when this hand went down and you know, the, the internet blew up. People lost their minds. Yeah. You know, I mean, some people would say I'm going ham. Um, you know, I like the word ham. Um, but I mean, listen, you know, I mean, uh, the, the, he'd, he'd won. He was really running hot. and I need something to turn around, you know, and I just said, you know, this is my time. I'm going to take this pot away from him. And, and, and that starts with sensing weakness. And uh, you know, listen, I give him a lot of credit. He used a time bank. Um, and, you know, he may even use another time bank. I know what he's thinking. He's thinking. I mean, part of him has to be thinking if I move all in here with deuces and I just give this to Phil when I'm so deep, you know, and uh, and I'm liable to outplay him, I'm going to be mad. It's so funny to me. I, I will say this. Daniel, the whole time, has been telling everybody that he's a big favorite against me in deep stack poker. I mean, I play deep stack no limit all the time. And he had a hot start a couple of times. He's like, well, my deductive reasoning suggests that you know, I mean, we have swings in these things, right? And so do I think he's better than me at deep stack poker? No, no, I never thought that. But but I didn't want to change the narrative. He had this narrative, I'm better than Phil at deep stack poker. And, uh, and you know, he ran super hot, and yet you can see I'm still in the lead. So got away with that one, would never in a million years show a bluff to Daniel. He's, he's too tough. And, you know, Daniel's one of the all-time greats in, in poker. Let me ask you this, Phil. How big of a thing is momentum in matches like this? Because clearly, you know, you, you put, put the pedal to the metal there in that hand, and then seemingly you get more confidence when a hand like that works out, and you start, you know, getting more into that zoom-zoom mode that you've discussed in the past. Yeah, zoom-zoom-zoom, and uh, wow, this one he turns deuces, and so this is another bad read. But I'm like, all right, he checked the flop, he may have, you know, he could have four, six suited at standing. He could have three, four suited, he could have ace four suited. He could have really anything here. And so I'm like, okay, I mean, you know, I'm going to take this pot away. I just don't think he can. I think he might be able to call me with pocket tens. He's definitely going to call with the king. Um, I might be able to get him to fold all ace highs. I might be able to get him to fold a five. And so, you know, look, I don't like it. I should be staring at him. You know, this is a bad read, you know, but I went for it and I had, to, I was smart enough to go for it, but I was also smart enough to give up on the river. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm like, okay, he has it. I didn't think it was three deuces, but I just kind of realized I can't get away with, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I made lots of probing bluffs and, uh, you know, a lot of them were right, but, uh, you know, this 300 hands, we both get tired and make mistakes and, you know, <laughs> good qu good question coming in on YouTube from Rigo. He says, hey, Phil, do you study mannerisms and reads, reads before the game, or does it come to you naturally while you're playing? 
Um, so a- almost all of it comes naturally. But of course, after the first match against Daniel, I watched the entire tape and uh, and realized, you know, the one thing when I when I watched the tape against Antonio, every time I said, I know you're bluffing and I folded, he was bluffing. And I'm like, let me put two and two together here. You know what I mean? And so, you know, and that's what I did. And so I just trusted myself. I'm like, you have to just go with your instincts. You just knew every time he was bluffing. So every time he bluffs, just raise him. And so same thing with Daniel. I had really good read on him. Um, I felt, and uh, you know, this one hurts. This one really hurts. I mean, Daniel, I don't know how early this was in the match, but I mean, he made a lot of hands early, uh, you know, I believe this was, was was a little little over two hours into the match. This this moment, yeah, this one hurt a little bit. I thought he was weak. I haven't dominated, and that flop, right? And he's pretty aggressive, so uh, I'm going to call on the flop. And the turn, the ten comes, and uh, you know, and nine comes, yeah. And so now I have a straight draw too. And now he bets, what does he bet? Seven or 8,000. And I'm just like, I just can't give up yet. But I, be, I was beginning to think maybe he had King Jack with the Jack of Diamonds and had me. And this is one, you know, I wish I wish that uh, this is one that I, oh, he only bet 6,000. 6, smart bet. So, so I don't have a choice. I have to call, uh, I think. Uh, I just can't get away there. And then the river, I think he bets 32,000 or something. Yeah, he lied to me again, too. You know, I don't know if I ever lied to him in any of the three matches, but he lied again. He's, I said, did you have me? And it's like, well, I don't know, Phil. <laughs> okay, Daniel. There, there, there was definitely some good banter going on as we watched the match here. Uh, for the people in the chat who are wondering, Phil and I are breaking it down for you here live. This match happened last night. It's all available on Poker Go. We're doing a bit of a review session, taking your questions, having some fun with it. And obviously, you know, if you guys have any questions for Phil, please send them into the chat. We're live on Twitch, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. That helps us a lot. And that is one of the reasons why we can put up this awesome content for you guys um people are are asking a lot about um how daniel's attitude towards you affected you or motivated you and and how did it make you feel because you guys were on the show with jeff and brent no gamble no future uh, quite a few times previewing each of your matches and 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 definitely uh daniel had a type of confidence that came across to you from from what i saw uh, as as a bit of a sort of you know being underestimated is that correct Remco, why don't you call it like you saw it? Like, give me the, the truth. Or I'm not going to answer your question. I mean, Daniel came into those conversations basically saying, I'm going to smoke Phil. He was condescending to me, yes or no? I don't know. I think he was overly confident. I can say that. I- wait, 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 wait. You watched the first match. Everybody in the world said he was condescending. Are you saying he wasn't? I mean, the first the first interview with Brent and Jeff, I, I can give you that. Yes, definitely. And the then first it, match, it was like six hours. He was condescending. Oh, oh you mean during the match? I, I'm I'm talking about the interview, but yeah, during the match, definitely. And and he he, he was he, condescending. He uh, was mean. He was, and I said, you know, uh, I'm just going to battle this with as much class as I can muster, uh, because I truly think Daniel is one of the all time greats. And and the thing about it is this. I just think Daniel is a little delusional. There's a button there that when there's a button, right? But listen, I'm fair, Rumco. I could be delusional too. So I always say it this way. I'm delusional thinking I'm great at poker, one of the all-time greats, or he's delusional thinking I'm not. One or the other is the case. But, you know, um, and so, I mean, he went a long ways to tear down my legacy. You know, he told everybody that I'm not a great player today. I'm not in the same league as a lot of these other players that, you know, uh, all this BS and, you know, and I, can I say that I'm a, a better player than all of the guys that are playing in the high rollers every day? No, I can't say I'm a better player. That's not fair to them, but it's not fair for them to say that I'm worse than they are, you know, because we don't know. I mean, I, and then, and then, you know, Daniel told some lies. I was a little upset. You know, he said, Oh, your lifetime loser in the high rollers. I'm like, wait, I'm up 1.8 million in the high rollers. And then rather than correct that mistake, he said, well, the sample size is small. He was like a politician just looking for every little area he can be right. Right. But then it it hurt. It hurt, you know, and like and then he didn't dare attack. 
you know, everybody could attack my cash game, televised cash game stuff in 2008, 9, and 10. But since 2014, uh, I won like 25 out of 26 times in televised cash games. Everybody knows this. I've been crushing everybody in these no limit cash games for like a decade. And so now he, you know, so he couldn't attack that, but he never mentioned that, right? And so, I mean, I just think he attacked my legacy very intentionally and very meanly and not fair. But I will tell you this, I received more support than I've ever received in my life from anybody. You can pause the hand if you want. Yeah. Definitely. I received more support from anybody that I've ever received in my life. And, uh, uh, you know, all these, all these pros that have been in the game for 20, 30 years, 15 years, were all like, wait a minute, this is not fair to Phil. You can't tell people that Phil's not one of the top 10 all-time greats in poker. You know, when it comes to tournaments, at least through th 2012, the only thing that mattered was World Series of Poker and WPTs, all the way maybe through 2014. Those are the only things that mattered. And I was down there all the time, right? And I have the best record by 10x of anybody, you know? Uh, and so to then say that I'm not the, you know, I mean, to me, I'm clearly the all-time great right now in tournament poker. Now, I'm not saying I'm the best player today, and I'm not saying I'll be the all-time great in five years or six years. Ivy might pass me. He had a great win. Daniel might pass me. There's a lot of guys that could pass me, right? But they're not going to pass me by playing 20-player high roller tournaments, right? But maybe some of those guys will. I mean, Stephen Chidwick is incredible, you know, a lot of these guys are just so talented and so good, you know, and, uh, but right now I've earned the right to become the greatest, be called the greatest, you know, the goat of tournament poker and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, but to not, but to then to just, to not even admit I'm in the top three or top five or even top 10, uh, that's just a little delusional, I think. So maybe I'm delusional, think I'm the greatest, but <clears throat> my record sure proves that. <clears throat> so. But like, by the way, I just want to tell you, the amount of support you're receiving right now in the chat is amazing, and everybody want everybody wants to see Phil versus Phil having Mr. Ivy in there for the next round. That is really cool to see as well. Love you guys all on Twitch, on Facebook, and on YouTube. I'm sure Phil appreciates that as well. Um, but Phil, is it is it perhaps fair to say? And and you know, please point out to me which part of your legacy uh, you care the most about. But is it fair to say that you're the greatest tournament player of all time? But right now, the young guys are playing at a higher level in tournaments. Is that fair to say? Or would you also say that, you know, in that realm, you're also still you know, top dog? I can't claim that I'm still the top dog in that realm, <clears throat> you know, but I'm not giving it to them either. Um, <clears throat> what I am saying is there's a bunch of incredible players out there that may be as good as me or may be better than me. I can't take that away. I haven't proven myself. But for those players, some of those guys are complete assholes, by the way, complete jerk offs and have complete disrespect for poker and for me. And it's a little frustrating. I can't mention anybody by name, but why would you knock me down? You know what I mean? Why would you claim, oh, well, I mean, they're jealous because I'm getting attention because I just keep winning stuff. So I, I don't like the way some of those guys, are, you know, I mean, I'll tell you one thing, you go back and you look at me in the eighties and nineties, I had complete respect for Chan Doyle, all the great players that came before me. Right. And some of these guys, man, they're just, I just, I just don't know what's wrong with them, man. They're so short-sighted. They think if they chop Phil down at the knees, they can stand on my shoulders, you know? And I'm just like, some are really, it's really frustrating. Anyway, back to this hand, I think I check raised the clock, right? Yeah, I believe so. And then you're you're about to you're look you're looking for more here on the turn. Right. <clears throat> I check I sensed that Daniel was weak and I check raised the flop. And uh and so I'm go ahead, I'm gonna keep betting. I bet fourteen thousand to seventeen thousand. Now he turned an open ender and he decided to gamble, right? You can see I turned the the high end of the straight draw. At this point, <clears throat> I'm pretty much just going for it, right? Like I'm going with my read. I thought maybe he had a, 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 a six, a maximum six, maybe a deuce. I didn't put him on a king. It's just not the way he plays a king to me. So right now I'm thinking I have to get him to fold a pair of sixes, right? This is my thought process. I'm just not giving up. I missed, but I'm going to put the big bet out there. I'm going to put the heat on him and see how he responds. And, and he knows that most of the time when I make big bets, I have it. 
So <clears throat> 35,000 seemed like a good number to bet. Uh, if I bet 50 or 60, it might seem like, you know, I wanted a call. If I bet 10, he's going to call me or 20. So I have to put enough money out there to represent, you know, a, a hand like kings and sixes, uh, a hand like, you know, uh, the ace, deuce of hearts or the king five of hearts or something, you know. And so <clears throat> I repped it. He sensed it again. Negreanu has incredible instincts. And he, he uses a time bank with a four, you know, come on. I mean, that's, that's beautiful poker, you know. And uh, luckily for me, he decided to make the fold. You know, um, but I like what he said afterwards. He said, I was afraid I was going to call you and then you were going to win. Uh, you know, and uh, and to me, that's a double a dub. That means two things. One, if I'm going to start calling you down a third or fourth pair, I'm going to lose this match. Right. And two, you know, was the obvious one where he's like, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to call you. And maybe you were bluffing with a, a six with a <laughs> eight kicker. <laughs> You know, he's considering that possibility as well. But look at him. I mean, give him max credit, man. I mean, you know, and I bet 34,000, which I think was was a, a little better bet, you know, um, and I get the full. Yeah, yeah that, but, that, but he kind of knew. I mean, you got to give the man credit. I mean, that that's what I love about this match is that neither of you were backing down. You guys both made sharp reads and sharp plays. You both, but you guys both had it had it swing in your favor in some of the hands, and, and ultimately, you know, you you go three in a row and you come out on top, and and your your resume in this format is just uh, you know unquestionably uh, exceptional. If if I if I can fi try to find words for it, and I think I can speak for the entire poker community that even though you and like even though Daniel took some you know serious swings at you, you swung back big here at at the poker table, and and ultimately, I think. That that's got that that's that has to be your biggest takeaway, right? From this whole series of matches. You asked me earlier if Daniel gave me extra motivation by attacking me, and of course he did. And Daniel has attacked me for fourteen years. I went to his wedding. You were there. We danced. Uh, that's a good song. We don't have that video. We have a great video of you and I dancing, right? <laughs> yeah, we do have it. <laughs> I love that video. <laughs> Fantastic. And night. we were at Daniel's wedding. <clears throat> I was. He said he likes to say that I was the only guy at both of his weddings. And so there's a respect there. There's a like of each other there. There's, you know, there's all that. So he's not, he doesn't hate me. He just, I, I just think, you know, um, I'm delusional in thinking that I'm the greatest or he's delusional in thinking I'm not the top 10 greatest, you know, and, and, you know, and that's all. But I mean, listen, we still like and respect each other. We'll still go to dinner together. We'll still have long talks. I mean, he and I did an event together in New York two weeks ago. And we rode up in the limo together and we spent the entire night together and we drank together for a couple of hours after the event. And, you know, and we spent a couple of hours in the limo on the way back with Scotty Wynn with us and uh, had some really pleasant, nice talks. So there's no other way. That's why I use the word delusional, because, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> I, I think it's impossible to ignore my record. Right. But, yeah. but listen, I mean, I know that deep in his heart, Daniel loves me. That's the truth. Absolutely. And I think that's likewise as well, right? It's true. Deep in my heart, I love Daniel too. And I, it kind of bummed me out that he attacked me. But, you know, he's, I mean, listen, <clears throat> you talk about, hey, does Phil have a chip on his shoulder? Well, I do have a chip on my shoulder, but he keeps that there for me. So there's another one where he makes the 7X with King 8, and I decide to fold the 910. I didn't have a feeling that he had the 4 5 suited this time, or I would have called. A question for you that I've seen come in a couple times now. People are suggesting, Phil, do you have a big tell on Daniel because you get it right so many times? I trust my tells with everybody I play against. And when it's right, it's right. Right. I mean, that, that's why I've won more tournaments than everybody else, in my opinion, is by making really good reads. I've won so many. I'll, I'll just remember so many times I'm at the World Series of Poker final table in the past and I look at my opponent and they bet the ace nine, seven flop. And I'm sitting there with queen 10 and I'm like, they have nothing. And they just made a big bet. And I just raise and I just win. And that's, those are final tables. I wish they had all the whole card plays that I've made in my life. That's just me looking at someone and saying they can't call. Right. And then sometimes, sometimes actually have jacks. And now they're like, they folded or Kings. They're like, Oh, you have the ace spill. And I never show those bluffs ever. So I always fold face down and smile. I don't, I won't lie to them. 
you know, and we'll go to the next hand. And, and so you can win a lot of tournaments if you can read people perfectly. That's just a fact. Another bad bluff on my part here. Queen High might have been goody. You know, like easy call for him. Definitely. For people in the chat, Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube, if you have any questions, please send them in. I'm going to try to look right now. And um, let's see. Um, questions coming in as well. We all know that Duck Polk and Daniel played a long, drawn-out format of online, like a huge sample size. I think they played 20,000 hands. Would you ever be interested in, in a format like that, like playing online f for a lot of hands? Or is it the live poker element that you know has your interest more? I mean, I, I told Doug that I'd play him uh, in, in that format, but only one game, one table. Right. Because there's some stuff I do at one table that I think is pretty good that no one else believes in. And so I told him I'd play him, but, he, but, but also if he laid me 10 to 1. So if someone thinks they're great, then, you know, then you have to use the, you have to use, you have to, yeah, listen, I've been in the game a long time. Right. I'm, I'm 56 years old right now. And so I know if someone's going to be really cocky and they want to lay a big price, take the price, you know. And so Doug wanted to, you know, was talking, hey, Phil, you know, you're, you know, I'm better than you are in, in this format. And I'll lay you 10 to one. So I said, all right, I'll play 10,000 hands and I'll take 10 to one. And, uh, you know, and I guess it would blow everybody's mind if somehow I, I won 350,000 and I cashed the 10 to one bet for a million. Right. Um, but can I beat Doug playing two games at once online? I think that's just tough, man. I mean, he's Doug's just so great. And uh, but one, there's something about playing one on one Holden that's been very good for me. So and if a guy wants to lay me 10 to one, sure. You know, but I don't have to step out of my comfort zone right now. I'm playing the best players in the world. Right. And, uh, you know, and they all think they're better than me every match. So that's fine. You know. I have a side street question going a little bit back in time because we referenced online poker. You've been around. You won the, you won the main event in 89. By the way, that whole main event, final table, is available on Poker Go. So if you are a fan of poker history, go check it out. You can watch Phil win the main event in 89. It's terrific. You can also watch the previous ones. You can win, you, you can see John Chen uh, win it. You can see uh, Stu Unger win it. We, all ha we have it all on Poker Go. My question is about online poker. Phil. When did you first hear about online poker? How, how, what were your views on it? And what was it like playing that, that first time you, you can ever play online? Because I'm curious about sort of the historic sort of story there. I think there was a site called Planet Poker way back then, or maybe, there, yeah, Planet, I think it was, or one of the really early ones. What were the first two or three? Yeah, Planet that? and Paradise Poker, I believe. Yeah, so Planet Poker is where I first played. And I thought, this is terrific. I can make a living using my wits and staying home. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, I didn't necessarily do super well playing online poker. We played limit hold'em in a very swingy game. Here's a hand where Daniel check raises the flop. And, um, and because I slow played deuces, I come, but you know, I, I think I would have been, you know, um, I would have been better off folding more to Daniel. Um, you know, but then maybe he would have bluffed me more right. too, you know, I mean, all this calling I made also, you know, makes it hard to firm the bluff. And I'm a little frustrated probably because I lost a couple of pots in a row, you know, because when it comes queen, queen seven and you have deuces, it's supposed to be good, you know? And so I'm thinking to myself, damn it, you know? Um, but yeah, so when it came to online poker and then, you know, and then now you fast forward, I didn't have the maturity and the skills that I have. Pause this hand. Yeah. I didn't have the maturity or skills that I have now back then. And so, you know, the one thing that happens is I've gotten better and better and better at poker, better at dealing with bad hands, better at dealing with losses, better at dealing with adversity, better at dealing with mean people at the table, better at everything in life. And so for me, you know, so for me, we have, uh, you know, uh, I, I made, I, I was playing this app. Yeah, I think it's poker to to poker R R R or whatever is the app we've been playing on. And I, I won about 1.55 million in a year playing on that app against in four or five different games. And, uh, and I haven't played in the last two months. I haven't played at all on the app. I'm really thinking about the Daniel match, doing a lot of business stuff. You know, this business stuff has been fun. You know, I signed with Bitcoin Latinum 
And, uh, and Remco, I want to talk about Bitcoin Latinum for a second. Bitcoin Latinum, I talked to several crypto groups. It was about a month ago. And all of a sudden, what I realized is everybody wanted them. And they were offering me shares and coins and deals. You know, and I'm a paid endorser of Bitcoin Latinum. I want to be very clear, you know, pre-ICO, <laughs> people get themselves in trouble like Floyd Mayweather. And so, but this is the project I love the most. And I signed with them. And, and what do you do? Well, the Bitcoin Latinum uh, has about five things going for it. The first thing is that um, the coin is supposed to come out at $20 around the 4th of July. And what you can use this coin for, you can buy a Starbucks coffee. The fees are going to be about 10 cents. Now, if you, you try to use Bitcoin or Ethereum to buy a coffee, it's a $10 fee. You can't use it at Starbucks. You are, are, and also, if you use Bitcoin or Ethereum, it takes 24 to 36 hours to process the transaction. We'll green light your transaction immediately, but then it'll also be cleared in three to four minutes, right? And so if you're spending more money, you'll get a much faster So, And maybe it'll be, I think, three to four minutes is what we think we can do right now. And so, you know, bigger transactions can happen a lot quicker. There's more trust. Now, it's a triple security system. You have a credit card, which is a metal card, and you have your phone, and you use your phone and your credit card as two layers of security, also a password. So triple layer security. Now, what does that allow us to do? It makes your coin super secure, but accessible pretty quickly. You don't have to memorize a 26 digit password, I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think the password can be a lot shorter with us. Now, you go, now we signed a deal with Martian McClenahan, where you can insure your coins. So you have some of these young poker players that have 10 million in crypto, 20 million in crypto. I know a couple of guys that have big numbers. They can have their coins insured. So can you imagine if, if you're using our triple security system and someone steals your 20 million, if someone steals your 20 million now, it's gone forever. Too bad. It disappears. But if you have if you have Bitcoin Latinum in 20 million and you're and you choose the insurance option with Marsha McClendon, then you know, then that's then then you can insure the coin. And the, the, the final thing that I love the most about this coin is we're in the process of, I have to be careful, process of raising a billion dollars, okay? And we'll put a billion dollars into a trust and we'll release 222 million coins. So therefore each coin is worth what? $4 a coin, $5 a coin to start. And that's backed by assets. But Remco, every time someone uses a 10 cent fee, we put 80% of that money into the trust. So if you get a million people using the coin per day, the trust grows to a trillion dollars, right? And then all of a sudden each coin, and we maybe we'll release more coins by then, but whatever the number of coins is out there, say it's 500 million at that point, all right? And we have a trillion dollars in the trust, each coin is then worth, how much is that, 2,000 a coin? And so it's kind of a beautiful project. Also, you know, there's some green, you know, when it comes to mining the coins, we're not burning the energy that the other people are. And so, you know, this seemed like a great project for me to get involved in. I'm going to be very clear. I'm not telling anybody to buy the coin. I'm not telling anybody to invest in the coin. This is not investment advice. I'm a signed endorser for Bitcoin Latinum. But you can see why I'm excited about the project. And, you know, I've had Ari on my hat most of the last 10, 11 years and now Bitcoin Latinum. Wow. Well, what I'm very excited about, Phil, is is the hand that we have here on screen because I'm not a I, I mean I'm an average poker player, but Queen Three suited is not in my range. However, you 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 managed to to get up to some creativity. Let us know what you feel about this hand. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I will say this: I, I you know before the flop, I made a bad read. I thought Daniel was weak, and I went for it. But I went for it big enough where he's not going to four bet me, right? He doesn't want to get too much money in with nines. Now he calls pretty quickly and now I'm thinking he has something and uh, you know, and, and I don't know how I'm going to proceed. You know, generally I just checked. I think I check here because I've checked a bunch of times, even with the eight, three clubs, I checked uh, the flop. And so, but now I've smashed this flop and I'm thinking, okay, I mean, please don't have ACE three or deuces full, you know, and now he bets uh, 7,000. 7, yeah. How much should I make it? 20 or 25, right? 25. Yeah, 25,000. I will put in a big raise, you know, and and he has to think, wow, is Phil putting in a big raise with Queens, Kings, or Aces? He doesn't think so. And he's right. I'm not going to play Queens, Kings, or Aces this way. 
but I would play three threes this way or the ace king of spades. Five of clubs on the turn. And now I just decide, all right, I'm going to check here and just see what develops, right? And so I make I make the check, and and now it goes to Daniel, and and I haven't decided what I'm going to do, but I I'm deciding now I'm deciding I've made up my mind I'm thinking right now and I've decided if he bets twenty or thirty thousand I'm going all in, I snap all in because I'm already ready. He put in too much money and I'm like if he has ace four I'm broke, if he has you know uh, you know a, a better three I'm broke, but I can't get away. There's no sense slow playing this hand here, right? I just have to get rid of all those equities. I also thought it was likely Daniel might have like, I don't know, the ace six of spades, you know, or the ace five of spades or, or two sixes. I'm thinking he has equity here, right? I mean, he has some sort of draw. So now I move on for 91,600. He picks up his hand a little bit, which scared me. You know, I'm like, oh shit, he has ace four. I'm going to get called and go broke. But then he starts studying and I realize, okay, I want 100% of the best hand. You can't say a word. And at this point, I'm thinking, I don't want him to call with the ace six of spades. Now, everybody else on the planet's like, of course we want him to call drawing. But I'm thinking, I don't want him to call. I just don't want to play a big pot, even if I'm three to one favorite. I want to grind him down because in this match, I think I was all in and called a grand total of one time in the first two matches. Well, and that's what people at home should be thinking about. Let me ask you this. Phil. I've been all in and called one time in three matches and two up to this point so now he's studying he's studying he's studying and now i'm beginning to think all right he does have tens and nines and i really do want to call here and when he asked me do you want are you drawing that was music to my ears because now i'm thinking okay he has two outs but i still have no opinion and now at this point obviously i want the call and uh, you know he uses i think does he use three time banks here that's that sounds about right let me ask you this though the the quick all in shove is is there a specific thought behind the speed at which you go all in there was a quick all in shove when i when i had 10 deuce of diamonds in the match before but generally when i have a quick all in shove i have it we've know the world's noticed that right quick all in shove phil has it right um but this is a tricky spot i just and i was thinking i was debating this hand with mike the mouth so would i check raise on with ace queen of spades or ace king of spades or queen four of spades. And I, I don't think I would. I think I'm just going to call the 30. I'm not folding. I think I'm just going to call with those hands. Um, so, you know, for me, I have to have it here, um, you know. But, you know, it's a tough spot for Daniel, you know, and here's his chance to win. I think he had me all in one time in the first match with queen six of clubs against 10 five of clubs. I don't think he had me all in the second match at all. And now, you know, that's that is your thinking is, wow, Phil's so slippery. I played 700 hands with him or 800 hands and he's never been all in. Here's my chance, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean. And uh, I don't like his call. I mean, I don't think Maria liked it. I don't think, I don't think, the, I think the poker world doesn't like his call here. I mean. Do you think you're going to show up here a lot with, with aces, kings, and queens? Yes. Yes, I do. I really do. Um Although I think if I had queens or kings, I would have studied a while before I moved in. So I think he can eliminate that, actually, because queens or kings, I'm going to study a long time and then maybe move in. Right. Or I'm just going to check raise or I'm just going to make a big bet on the turn. Right. So, you know, it has to be a super strong hand for me to do this. So now, of course, <laughs> now I'm thinking, all right, he has two, two outs. Don't do this to me. This, this wouldn't be fair. And the red tenant, we both jump out of our seats. You can see the reaction because anybody who's a professional poker player knows a red four across, which has, is going to get him out. And it was a freaking red 10. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, and it took, takes a second. It takes literally for like that one tenth of a second. You think it's, you know, it's a nine or a 10. And then two tenths of a second in, you've already started to jump and you realize it's a 10. And we're both like, woof, because it was a close one, right? So, but, you know, got it in at a great spot. Very proud of that. Play. When when you get a big chip lead like this, is it hard to is it hard to stay focused because you're sort of celebrating a little bit internally? No, or, no, 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 no. You, you, no, 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 no. I mean, that's kind of stuff that amateurs do or pros that don't play a lot do. You got the chip lead. You got a chance to put somebody away. You better not make any mistakes. Now, you know, all these limping with all these pairs. Um, I finally flopped a set, and uh, he's caught on it with a six. 
So I decided to bet. Now I bet enough on the flat on the turn here where he wouldn't fall with three, four, or four, five. That was my only thought process. Is I don't want him to fall with one of those hands because I know he's drawing dead unless he has three, four, or four, five. And uh, and after the call comes, now I'm like, all right. I still in my mind I don't want a three, four, or five. That's all I'm fading in my mind because those are the only live draws. And there's a five which I don't love, but come on, it's, it's a great card. Just being super paranoid and now you know now there's twelve thousand out there and now how can i get some money paid off so how how long should i take to bet i decided to bet fairly quickly i decided to bet half the pot he'd seen some half the pot bluffs for me already by then and uh you know and i think you know and i think that you know this is a spot where i could have had anything and and i especially based on watching the rest of the match i don't blame him for falling here Right. Uh, I think if I bet 8,000, he doesn't call. Right. I just want to give a quick update for the people who are just tuning in because we have a lot of new people constantly joining us here on the stream. Uh, we are watching the high stakes duel two round three Helmuth versus Negranu from last night the $400,000 match we're watching it now with Phil Helmuth breaking it down if you want to watch the whole match it's available on Poker Go. use the promo code DUEL3 to sign up right now to take $20 off the annual sub and we also have High Stakes Poker World Series of Poker Poker After Dark all the classics are available on Poker Go. so go check that out if you want to watch all the matches and of course also the matches between Phil and Antonio those first three are also available on Poker Go. If you questions for phil send them into the chat we are live on twitch on facebook and on youtube we got a lot more exciting hands to come here on the stream we appreciate everyone tuning in and please hit like subscribe do all that good stuff here on the stream that's all we ask for in return of this show um phil you have the momentum on your side here you are the chip leader you have him right where you want it um is this where he hits where he beats my top pair of three hands in a row I'm, do you have all three hands here we're, I, I think we do i think we do um, but basically when you, when you're in this spot, what's, what's going through your mind in between hands or are you just trying to be Zen? What's, what's happening? Yeah. I'm just, listen, I mean, you just don't want to make a mistake, right? Right now I have more. I want them. Right. And so, oh, this hand, oh, God damn, this one hurt because when he raised pre-flop, I'm never folding. I actually thought about moving in and, you know, and I'm just, I just, but I don't want to double them up. Right. So I'm thinking to myself. Eh, you move in with threes and, and he decides to call with eights and you just, you've doubled up for no reason. You know, you're going to have to make him earn these chips, you know, and I'm pretty good at riding the lead in these things, you know, I mean, and so I don't, the one thing you don't want to do is do something fancy and have your horse break his leg when you're way up. You know what I mean? You don't want to break your horse's leg, you know? So I call now interesting hand here because you know, the flop comes ace King nine. He flops a flush draw. Now I have a chance to win this pot, you know, um, he bets out and I raise them, which was brilliant. I like the raise, uh, you know, because I'm also trying to get him to fold eights. He knows that I studied legitimately before the flop and he knows that I'm not screwing around. So I know he knows that I have ace queen, ace jack, ace 10 or a pocket pair. He has to, he has to know this because the one thing, is that I, as I, as I don't study there with nothing ever and ask him how much he has left. I always have something. So now I'm like, okay, this is a good flop to represent that I had ace nine or ace 10 now. And he knows this. So he doesn't want to even move in here because he doesn't want to get it all in the flush draw on bust. Right. And plus, you know, if he is ace king, it makes sense for him just to call too. Are you not afraid of him having a king or an ace? Yeah, of course. But, but, but I also thought, you know, there's, but I can get him to fold jacks or eights or, right. you know, maybe queens. There's a lot of hands I can get him to fold. Now, I had a chance to just win this pot just by making a crazy bet on the turn, right? But now I'm thinking five deuce. I was thinking, man, you need to hit a three now. And then, you know, give Negron your credit here. I mean, he's playing for his life here. And this is a huge pot for him. And uh, he goes ahead and makes a big bet. And, uh, you know, and for me, it's almost impossible to call here. Um, I think it was a mistake for him to show me the hand. Uh, you know, I just don't think you ever want to show me anything. If, if, you've, if you learned one thing about me when I folded the ace jack spades is that, you know, that was a fold no one's ever seen before. And it was right. So that makes it really spooky. 
And then all these guys want to tell you, well, you should have called because you have so many chips behind and if you hit it, da, 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 da. yeah, well, there's a few scenarios that work out well and we are deep, but this is a one shot thing. If we're playing a cash game, then I'm calling them because I'm not 100% sure he has me beat. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I could have made a big bet there on the ace king nine on the turn and just won that pot and he'd be down to 44,000. Right. You know. But you still you still had a very comfortable lead and, and we'll we'll keep following the action. We got a question coming in on Twitch from Yankee No Name. He says, "Who's the better player, Chamath or Jason?" Chamath, definitely. It's not even close. Uh, <laughs> but 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 Jason, but Jason is da- Jason's dangerous. This hand here, I should have made another bet at this maybe, but nah, I, I don't have a problem with it. I fired out once with eight high. And, you know, and I just, I thought the 10 was a card that was likely to hit him if he didn't have me beat already. And uh, so I don't mind the check here. Uh, to come back to Jason and Shamath, I mean, they're both great guys, amazing people. I get a lot of time with both of them. Shamath is my best friend on the planet um, by 10X. We have a very special relationship. And, um, and I value my relationship with him as a best friend over all my friendship relationships. And so, you know, Chamath and I have this special thing going on. We've both been super busy right now. Unfortunately, we haven't been getting enough time together lately. Uh, and Jason Calcanis is just a super talented, super fun, nice guy. Everybody would want to be playing with Jason because he has you laughing the entire night. He just, he just has a way of teasing people and he crosses the line a little bit, you know, sometimes, but he is, he's just sensational. He's just really fun to be with. So, you know, um, but when it comes to poker, um, you know, I've seen, I've seen two months, three months straight where Jason's a better player than Shamath, but most of the time Shamath is a better player than Jason. Moving into a a clash that could have been very painful if a King had flopped since you guys both have one. Um, but definitely over the course of this match, and of course we're watching a condensed version here, it's, it was a six-hour match roughly. Um, you guys played hundreds of hands, and it, it takes a tremendous amount of focus and stamina to, to stay in the game and to, to always make those correct decisions. Uh, and, and that's what I really enjoyed from last night's match is how it was very palpable that neither of you guys wanted to give in. No matter what the you stack know, it's were. also it's all, I get a little frustrated too sometimes with, with by, by some of the commentators. You know, I mean, like, like I mean, like we put in five k each when I had him dead, right? And then we put in fifty five hundred each where he had me, and like it was this huge bad beat or something. You know, I mean, like, you know, and then I, but there's there was there was a little bit of time. See, I told you that I love uh, Ali and Maria both. They're and you know, but it, it seemed they were a little bit. They were looking to push the narrative, Phil is lucky. And I was getting a little frustrated as I'm watching it. I think I hit threes and eights against Chamath. I mean, excuse me, against Daniel coming up, you know, and, but they forget the one where he had a belly buster 10 for 36,000 in ship. You no. Know? And when I complain, he hit the belly buster, like, well, Phil, you just hit an eight. Yeah. For like a pot that was much smaller. Yeah. A little bit, you know, but I mean, whatever. I guess I'm nitpicking a little bit. I mean, those they, they did they did well actually in the, in the booth. Those two. But 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 don't you have the last laugh anyway? You won three in a row. Yeah, but I mean, you know, when Maria Ho tells everybody the ace jack of spades was a bad fold, then I'm like, this is why this is why I stood up and beat my chest. Apex predator shit, bro. Because Nick Showman couldn't understand how I folded King Ten. I limped in. Uh, uh, and uh, Antonio raised two or three big blinds uh, and I folded he had king queen and Nick was like wow that was a horrible fold and then literally 10 minutes later I had king jack I limped in and Antonio raised three big blinds and I folded king jack which no one has ever seen before right and so they're like that was horrible so Nick immediately judged both those plays as horrible play horrible play and Ali's in the booth he's like are you sure his opponent had king queen both times just because you don't agree with something, you have to look at what actually happens sometimes. And so to me, when I made those folds and I watched them on television, I was dancing. I'm like, wow, that was incredible. I look at all the love I'm going to get. And instead they went the other direction. And so when Marie did that to me, when Maria did that to me with the ace jack of spades, I was kind of like a little bit pissed off. I'm like, 
I'm like, didn't she watch the other matches? Does, doesn't she know that I'm making these incredible laydowns? Doesn't she know this is the whole reason I, I went Apex Predator, I use that line, because I keep making these huge laydowns. And listen, if Antonio, uh, if I call with King Ten or King Jack, and he gets a king, I'm going to lose a huge portion of my chip. Same thing with the ace, jack of spades. And so, yeah, it's a little frustrating when, when, when someone, you know, in the booth is, isn't prepared to give you credit because they've been taught this is correct. Right. And you're talking about Maria and you're talking about Nick Showman, both great players, but they've been taught the specific style. Here's the dogma. Da, 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 da. This is a list of rules. Phil Hellmuth deviates from the rules. He is wrong. All right. Phil Hellmuth deviates from the rules. He is wrong. Phil Hellmuth deviates from the rules. He is wrong. Right. And so that's the BS. And I'm just like, what? I deviated from the rules because it was right, not because it was wrong. Right. And so, you know, the whole thing is a little bit like, you know, frustrating to me. You know, you would have to eventually say, uh, you know, hey, if this guy's doing what he's doing, then maybe this dogma is wrong. Or maybe he understands this dogma that he was supposed to do this, but he had such an amazing read. Why can't they see the read? Why can't they rejoice in the read? So Brent Hanks in the chat made a, made a good comment that, that ties into my next question. Uh, Hanks said, brilliant fold, next level. We cannot understand this level. And that ties into my question, Phil, because is it safe to say that for the vast majority of poker players, it's best to stick to what the books say because it's a safe way to play and that it only applies yes. to someone like you to fold the king jack there. Yes. I knew when I folded the ace jack of spades. All right. Or king, yeah, ace that, jack, yeah. That no one has folded ace jack of spades ever in the history of a match on television. It's never happened. And to fold it for one raise from a guy who had put in a lot of weak raises the match before, I knew how weird that looked to the world. I, and I, not only that, the really, really smart people are going to start studying that and saying, wow, why did he do that? Right? Everyone knows it was a read. Everyone knows it was a read. You'd have to be stupid not to understand it was a read. Uh, but I mean, to me, that was the, the, the hand of the match. Now here's one where Daniel and I play a small pot, right? And I turn the nuts straight. Now I assume he's drawing dead here. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, all right. He's drawing dead, but he can't pay off much. So I bet 2000 so that he would raise. I thought if I make it 2K, he might try one of these crazy representing the flush raises. So I actually put a little meat on the bone so he would make the raise. And when he makes 15K, I snap him and I had no choice. Yeah, of course. Um, just an unlucky hand for me. But to come back to the ace jack of spades, I knew that that hand is going to be watched for the next five years or longer. And everybody's going to be learning from that hand. Everybody learned from me watching the way I played poker, all right, for all these years. Wow, Phil did this. Is it right or is it wrong? In 2002, they said I was playing wrong. In 2004, they said I was playing wrong. In 2006, they said I was playing wrong. In 2008 and 9, Daniel wrote 80 blogs about how badly I was playing. In 2010, they said I was playing wrong. In 2012, they said I was playing wrong. In 2014, they said I was playing wrong. In 2016 and 18, they said I was playing wrong. Coming into these matches, they put me as an underdog in every freaking match. Even after winning five in a row, somehow they said I was a three to two underdog against Daniel. Now I thought to myself, really? We played two matches, 600 hands. I was all in one time. What does that mean? He couldn't win those matches, right? I was all in and called, right? And yet I wasn't even happy with the way I played in match two. And so, you know, I mean, to me, the whole, so yeah, I, I, I'm a, maybe you can tell from my voice, I'm a little bit fed up with this right. bullshit so, of, of so not it, enough it, respect. I'm a little bit fed up because I've been listening to it from right. all these top players. Just because you don't understand why I folded ace, jack of spades doesn't mean that your dogma is right. Right. But, but, but wouldn't, wouldn't it be fair to say that for someone like yourself, you can just let the results speak for themselves and the haters can hate all they want, but they can't touch your results. I can't. When you get attacked by another great player, like I don't want my ego to come out. History is going to judge me. Like in this, just in this interview, I'm talking about how I'm the greatest of all time. I don't want to say that ever out loud. But when someone else tells me, when, other, some, when, one of the, when maybe the biggest voice or the second or third biggest voice in poker 
is Daniel Negreanu. And when he says, I'm not top 10, brain fuel, baby, brain <laughs> fuel, go brain fuel. When he says, I'm not top 10 greatest poker tournament players of all time, I'm like, what the fuck? What do you, I mean, come on. So now he's forced me to get egotistical. He's forced me to defend myself. I don't want to tell people this. I told people this in 03, 05, all the way through 17. I just want to play poker. I want to put up all the bracelets. But if someone is going to publicly attack my legacy, one of the biggest voices in poker, then yeah, I feel like I have to defend myself. So I apologize to the people out there that think my ego is out of control. I'm actually probably in a, in a fairly modest place, despite the fact that I'm apparently bragging too much. Uh, we got a question coming in, or a, a, a very interesting note on uh, Facebook from Stephanie Unger, uh, the daughter of Stu Unger. She's watching right now. Stephanie, thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Um, love to have you back on the show, by the way, at some point. Uh, Stephanie says, I can understand what he's saying. I know my dad would have probably said the same. Some things aren't understandable. It leaves a little room for natural instinct. How does that make you feel? Oh my! See, see, I love Stephanie. You know, we 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 did uh, we put some pictures together. She asked me to participate in an interview. I immediately said yes uh, to participate in a, a documentary. And then she and I hung out in my room a little bit. It was nice. You know, we really kind of enjoyed the company. And Stu Unger would have understood the Ace Jack fold absolutely. He would have understood the eight three of clubs move. He would have understood all this stuff. Um, now here, wow, this this hand. All right, so listen. I opened for 8,000. I got to tell you something. Look at Daniel. Look, look, look. He makes a 21,000. He scared the hell out of me. I'm like, God damn it, he has aces. I mean, I immediately thought he has aces or kings. I mean, it hit me like a thunderbolt. And I'm like, and I'm actually considering, what did he make, a 23,000? But he just, I just thought he has the nuts. And I even consider at this point, I'm considering folding. Uh, kings you know i'm actually thinking about folding kings and then i just realized that he could have queens or he could have ace king i didn't have the perfect aces read i just felt like he had ace king suited aces kings or queens and so when i move in and he snap calls yeah i'm scared he was teasing he's messing around saying oh what did you do this for because he also has kings he's just having fun but when he called i had a sheepish look on my face because he snap called man and i'm like he has aces or kings and uh, even with Ace King, he would have, you know, studied at least like two or three seconds. I want us to, and I want so, us to listen to uh, to what happens on the flop and, and Daniel's basically uh, begging for a diamond. Let, let's listen in, Phil, and then I want to hear your thoughts after. He did definitely wince as yeah. though Daniel was right. just going to produce know. aces. There. Right. <laughs> you did kings like, ugh. <laughs> I guess I could have. Yeah, aces. I thought he had aces. It happens. He only made a 23 before the flop. Yeah. yeah. Red. Red. Ooh. Red, baby. Oh, my I want goodness. one. One. I just want one. <laughs> one, please. It's coming. I know it. I know it's coming. I know it. It is coming. Diamond has to come. It has to come. It must come. Diamond. All my energy into a diamond. I don't need to win pretty. Just make it red, but the other red. Come on, baby. He's sweating. I'm sweating the other way. He's hanging on. Come on, red. Red diamond. Please, Kings beat Kings. begging you, dealer, begging you for the diamond. Ooh. Yes, they will. Oh, baby. And Negreanu wow. doubles. <laughs> 50, I mean, I have never seen Daniel act like this before, Phil. It's intense, man. You know, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on he and I. Uh, you know, I mean, he called me out as not being great at poker, you know, and uh, he wants to beat me. And then he got slayed in the media. He got slayed on Twitter. He got slayed everywhere. Because, you know, to not give me a top 10 spot, I mean, you know, as one of the greatest poker tournament players of all time, I think that came back to haunt him. And he just like, I think he had to block a bunch of people on Twitter. I think a lot of people came after him. It was super disrespectful. I, I don't think that Magic Johnson should, you know, attack Michael Jordan. I think it's a bad look, you know. And so, yeah, so, I mean, he's emotionally, super emotionally invested in this and, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't think I, I don't think I said one, I don't think I said one word. I just paid it. Yeah, you were very calm, and 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 Daniel, of course, actively rooting for the di for the diamond. Any other scenario, this is a chop pot. We move on, and we probably never talk about it again. Uh, but this 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 did bring the match closer together again, and it it sort of continued onwards uh, in this moment. Uh, were you were you hurt a lot by by the diamond on the river? No, I mean, like. Uh, 
like, you know, I had already, you know, I, I had already counted the chips and a lot of times I just put them in the middle and that way the diamond hurts less, but I knew it was whatever, 102,000. And so, you know, whatever. And now I know he has a chip lead, but I can't afford to lose focus. And look, you can see he has a chip lead. I can't afford to get emotional in that moment. It's too intense right now. I have to keep my head down and pay attention. And, you know, it was pretty entertaining. Daniel was very entertaining and super emotional. And that was an entertaining moment. It's not something you want to have happen to you. But you know what I mean? I mean, and, it's, it's you know, also... It, and now, it, it, it goes to show how big you guys are and how much the fans love it because we posted the clip of the Kings versus Kings hand on the PokerGo YouTube channel. And I believe we got 40,000 views in like three hours. Like the people just love that stuff. And it's just it's just a, a crazy moment. I uh, got a question I got to squeeze in. Dapper Dave on, on YouTube. He Wait, let me just talk about oh. this. This is a pivotal moment okay. in the match. I felt, like, I felt like after Daniel got lucky, I felt like there was a little bit of opportunity for me to step up my aggression but not in an emotional way where it looked like I was steaming, not in an out of control way. So I just decided, I just kind of went for the next 12, 13 pots. And I think I won, I think they said I won 11 out of the next 12 pots. This with deuce seven offsuit. And then I barrel the flop after it comes like nine, four, five. And I just kind of went for it. I could see Daniel was kind of content. He was kind of happy. He knew he got really lucky. He knew he was back in the match. And so he was sit resting on his laurels just a little bit there. And, uh, and I just went ahead and I won a bunch of pots, you know, you definitely turned up, turned it up a little bit. And that was really fun to watch a question from Dapper Dave on YouTube. He says, uh, please ask Phil, uh, about his, his strength in mental stamina. Does he have any suggestions for how we can improve in that area? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I'm always promoting brain fuel, brain fuel, <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I think this one, this one, you know, I, I, I rested for a day or two before this match and, uh, and that helped me, you know, I, uh, my kids are adults and, you know, and, uh, and so I can go to Vegas and spend a couple of days just getting kind of rested up. I think that helped me. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's just a grind sometimes. And I know in the second match, I was super tired and uh didn't play my best here i bet a little bit too much on the river um and i think daniel's thinking about raising me here he's thinking about representing the flush and i think i might call him because in my mind i was thinking maybe he had jacks uh and that's why i value about the river um but yeah he's thinking about pulling the trigger here i, I wish he would have because i would love to have made this call for like fifty thousand more i would love to have snapped it and shown the world what I'm really made of. But actually, I'm glad he didn't do it because I won the match anyway. <laughs> okay, never mind. Uh, but, but back to my question. How can other people watching this improve their, their mental strength during poker? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a lifetime of playing for me, right? And so what you learn is, what you learn is, when I got badly, when I got tired in my 20s, I played badly. I couldn't hold it together, right? And that's just the way it went. And then I'd play badly, then I'd go on tilt. And it was a very bad combination. I still won more than anybody else did during those decades, right? But I wasn't as strong mentally. And so, <clears throat> here we go, <clears throat> seven deuce hand. <laughs> now I really stepped up the aggression. These hands are all like back to back to back to back. And uh, I'm going for this pot too. Uh, I decided every time I had seven deuce, I just kind of made a snap decision. I'm gonna try to bluff Daniel. Um, because seven deuce is a hand where if you're a hand reader, then maybe he would read super strength instead of super weakness. And so I follow through with a big bet on the turn here. I don't want to leave any doors open. I don't want him calling with nine, 10. I don't want him calling with queen, 10. I don't want him calling with an eight. You know, I've decided to go for it. I think I bet like 25,000 here or something, 22,000. Yep. And he didn't have anything, but this is kind of like, all right, I'm chipping away. I'm chipping away. I'm chipping away. And, uh, I put a bunch of bluffs in there, three, four bluffs, but it's funny to me. Then Maria and Ali are like, Oh, Phil's really hitting a lot of hands here. You know? And I'm thinking, didn't they just see those two bluffs? There are three bluffs like or four bluffs I put on, but it's okay. I mean, you know, um, by the way, Bitcoin Latinum is a hard fork. I'll say that. Remember I'm a paid endorser, but it's a hard fork of Bitcoin. Um, 
let's see, do I steal this one too? I want to I want to ask you also while the match is going on, and please, you know, I, you're always free to interrupt. Um, WSOP no. schedule has been announced. It's going to be in the fall because you know pushed back because of COVID. Um, what's your excitement level towards having the WSOP back in your life? You missed one year of, of winning bracelets because personally, online bracelets don't count in my book, Phil. Online bracelets don't count. So, how excited are you that WSP is back, and are you going to play a full schedule? Yeah, you know the one thing I realized when I went to uh, so I I made a tactical decision to play more no limit hold'em tournaments and less of the 10k mixed game events, which I think was a very poor decision. Um, but I made that decision because I thought it's easier to get to the one hole. I know with these 10ks, you're playing against a bunch of great players. I know that I can final table. The problem is when you get down to three-handed in a stud tournament or some of these other mixed games, there's still a lot of luck involved. Now you're down to three-handed. And like if I'm down to three-handed, no limit hold'em, my close rate's incredible. Now I get three-handed and do a mixed game and I just lose two standard pots in a row. And all of a sudden I'm short on chips. And so just from a tactical, from winning max bracelets, Winning max bracelets perspective. Here's an interesting hand where Daniel bets 6,000 and he gets unlucky with the jack on the river here. Now I have sixes and a flush draw. Uh, he could have a five here. Next though, and now I have top two, and I'm like, I don't think he's checking it. I think I have to get some value from this, you know. But <clears throat> I can't get too much value. Um, if I bet 12,000, he probably only falls with the five. So I made a very small what, little seven K bet. I like, I think that was the perfect sizing here. And, you know, he says, well, if you have two diamonds, I win. Well, no, not those two diamonds, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's possible I would have valued about eights, nines or tens here. So he, I think he has to call. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the world series, so what happens is I go over to, you know, King's casino and Rosvidov for the WSOPE. And, you know, there's one tournament a day. So I play the mix games. And in the eight game mix, I have a third place. And then five days later, I have a second place. Now I blew that second place. Give credit to the guy that won it. But I blew it, man. I mean, I got, I was so fucking tired when I got heads up in that eight game. And the guy I was playing against didn't have a lot of experience in all the games. If you ask him, he's not very experienced and he had never played RAS before in his life, I guess. And had never played stud eight or before in his life. And so he's down there and I should have closed better again, give him credit, but I, but I take it on myself for blowing that tournament. And so you look at the last 10 tournaments I played at the world series. I had a sixth in the five K no limit hold'em, sixth place with 500 players, then a third and a second. So maybe it's the last 16 tournaments at the WSOP. I had a sixth, a second and a third. So you're damn right. I'm excited to get back. And what I realized when I started playing the mixed games again is, uh, you know, a lot of people have really are really playing poorly in those mixed games, which I saw 10 years ago, then three years ago, they seem to be playing it better. And I think that's a reason that John Hennigan has got there so often. He's great at the mixed games and I've made a mistake, not hopping in there and playing with him and against him. That Hennigan's great. I'm not saying I'm in this league in all those games, but I'd like to have a chance to prove him in his league in all those games. But it, it is going to be exciting to have you back on the felt inside the Rio. Um, you know, are you are you thinking to yourself for every year that I play? You know, I, I can average one bracelet or one every two years. I know the fields are massive. I know there's a lot of variance involved. How do you look at that legacy? I know. I think you, the number you put out there is 24, right? You know, 2018, I played the five thousand dollar buy-in. Uh, you know turbo tournament right and uh, you know they said phil has no chance in turbos i mean because there's too much math <laughs> even though i'd already made one final table and that one i played and uh and i just they just they, they were playing too fast to me you know and so you know i mean i needed tens to beat queen nine i needed jacks to beat ace four and all of a sudden i had the chip lead we get to that final table i'm feeling good and i'm one of the chip leaders but as time passed, we got to forehand and there was a guy going ballistic, crazy, raise, 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 raise. And I didn't pick anything up and I went way down on chips, you know, I wasn't necessarily expecting the win there. You know what I'm saying? Just hanging around, hanging around. I remember 
I never do this, but I stalled a minute just because I knew the break was in one minute. And, uh, and, uh, and I just wanted to get to the break without busting in the last two hands. You know, we're down to three handed. And I came back and, you know, they proposed a three handed deal where we can save some money. Right. And I don't know. I just, or we talked about it briefly and we didn't make a deal. So now we're, so now we're, now we're in, uh, so now we play and all of a sudden we get heads up. I move an ace five offsuit and I get called by Kings, the first hand back from the break. And I hit an ace and a five. So my one, that was my one lucky break at that final table to propel me on. And all of a sudden we're all three of us, even in chips. Nobody talks about a deal. We're playing for a lot of money, 500, you know, 300 and 200 or something. And uh, then we bust the, the other guy and now we're heads up. We made a small financial save, uh, but played for at least half the money. And, uh, but I wasn't necessarily expecting a bracelet. And all of a sudden I picked up bracelet number 15. You know, there were some other times in the past where I was expecting a bracelet, but didn't win. All right. All right this hand, I, I, I think I made a very bad check. Uh, I think I have to bet the river there. And I think I have to bet like uh, either go really big 50,000 uh, to make it look like a bluff or, you know, I was also thinking you could beat me with five, seven of clubs. So that's pretty remote, you know, um, I need to bet there. And I need to bet, you know, I also thought maybe as a busted flush draw, but I need to bet that hand. And I, I should have either come small, like 12 K, which he probably pays off, or I should have come really big with 50 or 60, which he might pay off. But I missed a bet with the aces and deuces. Quick little message here to everyone who is watching and just tuning in. We are still live taking your questions on Twitch, on Facebook and on YouTube. Ooh, Go ahead. Here's a hand. Go. So I raised with King five and he calls. I started becoming, as the blinds became bigger, I started raising on the button versus limping every time. And so now I have to, now I decide that there's 20 out there. I decide to bet out 14,000. And based on his reaction, I'm going to decide whether I'm going to bet the, the turn or, and I just didn't think he had it. I just, I just didn't, I thought at best a, a weak queen. And so I'm like, all right, 40K should get the job done. And so I'm like, but now I'm really in a rhythm, I'm not playing my cards anymore. I'm playing his cards. And uh, I just don't think he can call 40,000. I'm like, all right, I'm going to keep the fucking pressure on and hammer this pot, you know, 40,000. It's a big bet. He might even fold an ace and a three, right? And if you turn the volume up, he says, nice bluff. I know you had nothing, but I didn't have, but I had nothing also. Let's see. He was right again. You won that pot. You earned it. You earned that one. I mean, I just had such air too. <laughs> Good job. But I just had such air there too. Good yeah. job. And so, yeah, that's a nice one because now I'm going to really put myself in a commanding position in this match again, um, you know, and, and made a lot of bluffs, uh, you know. I couldn't depend on the cards, you know. I, I like I like playing heads up and, 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 and I, it's really fun when the cards are there because people don't play very well against me. But then sometimes you just have to... Uh, just have to go for it. Absolutely. Uh, for the people who are asking, promo code on Poker Go Dual Three for twenty dollars off your annual sub. That means you get US Poker Open, you get Poker Masters, you get Super High Roller Bowl, you get World Series of Poker, High Stakes Poker, all the High Stakes Dual, even High Stakes Feud. When we had Doug versus Daniel in the studio, you get it all. So don't forget to subscribe right now. And we got a big WSOP schedule uh, to be announced soon with regards to the live streaming. Uh, we got some questions coming in. Please keep those coming. I just want to. So that's this. another bluff. Let me say one thing. Because we need the people to like and subscribe to our channel because that's the only way we're going to keep doing this. Phil, the floor is yours. So I, they just announced I'd won 10 of 11 hands since the Kings. Well, that was at least the third bluff we, we saw where I went crazy with King 5, 7 deuce, 4, 5. And I think there was another one in there. So, I mean, I was really going for it. Now, here I open with Ace Queen. I make it 11,000. Now, I can fold this hand, by the way. If I think, if I think Daniel is Ace King, I'm going to fold. And I don't mind because I'm Phil and that's what I do, right? And so but he goes all in, it's 80,000 more. And, uh, and now I'm thinking I haven't beat him. I'm thinking he has ace jack. I'm thinking there's something wrong. He does not have ace queen. He does not have ace king. He doesn't have aces, he doesn't have kings. And so I'm thinking there's something wrong. I'm actually thinking he might have ace rag here. But I give him my max ace jack and I'm like, 
And when I say out loud, I, I don't think I can fold this one, then I think he shows more weakness. And now I'm like, oh, for sure, I have to call. Now, you know, pardon me if, if I, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to lose this time. I put the chips in. He's already outdrawn me once. I don't want to have to recount him. I just want the money in there. If he wins, it's already out there. I've already paid the right amount. He's already told me at 91. Afterwards, there's some confusion. But, and now, uh, but I'm not expecting anything. But he says, oh, I see a queen. Queen 95. Now I think I'm going to win the match. I look at the backdoor clubs I haven't covered. Now, there are no backdoor clubs. Uh, I think there might have been backdoor clubs. I wonder if the graphics were wrong. We'll see the overhead shot probably. To, yeah, to the graphics down. wrong. That's funny. I think the graphics wrong. No, it's it's right. Look, one, no, it's right. One okay. club. So I'm thinking, all right, and then boom. I don't know how this king comes. I, I was just I, I, at that point, I was a little stunned, but I was also like, hey, listen, don't get excited. You know, you've seen the best hand win in weird ways. Probably coming in ace or queen. Daniel's already said out loud, if you roll it back, he said you deserve to win. You played great today. If you roll it back to the to the before the flop comes. He's going to say, I deserve to lose. You deserve to win. Before the flop. Get bailed out again. Okay, yeah, different there it is. Escape here, though. myself in the back of the barn. <laughs> Turn it up. Played, yeah. Yeah, Phil. You played really good either way. Tap my, if I was wearing a hat, I would tip it to you. Picks up the ace queen. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely uh, no, the, the, the tap of the feet. If, if, Hold if, on. No, he, he just said it. He said, you played great today. Did you miss it? Yeah, but he also said, uh, you deserve to win right before that. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think you talked over it, but I, we heard it. Let's go back one more time. The king. Hold on. Blocker as a bluff. I don't think I can fold this one. Turn into the ace queen. Remember that early in the match, ace jack suited. Ace queen? Yeah. Phew. That's good news. <laughs> I was bluffing. Hit the muck. All right. After now we limping. need to get bailed out again. Very by the different deck. landscape here, though. myself in the back of the barn. <laughs> good play, you, uh, Phil. You played really good either way. Tap my. If I was wearing a hat, I would tip it to you. Picks up the ace queen. Okay. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Keep going. Keep going. Here comes the flop. Oh, I see a queen. Ooh, I think. Yeah. She's gonna do slow roll. My <laughs> goodness. Yeah, that makes it tough. Queen nine five. What do I got? Five. Nothing. Just backdoor straights and a king. I don't deserve to win this one, honestly. You deserve it. Just Still hope to. Okay. So that was classy. I don't deserve this one. You deserve it, he said. Which is also, like, makes me a little bit more worried a king is coming. <laughs> <laughs> but that was nice of him to say, because Daniel had given me zero credit in anything. Uh, even the last two matches he ran back, talking about, you know, how great he played. And, and you know... And, uh, you know, honestly, I played horrible in the first match, the first half of that match, you know? And so if you want to insult me there, it's true. I came in super tired, wasn't paying attention. The second match, I came in fresh, and I just played bad. So let me ask you this, Phil. How much are you going to rub it in to Antonio and, and, and Daniel over the next couple of decades? Because you can always hold this over them. Pause it. So... Antonio and I have said zero negative stuff to Antonio. Uh, but even, in a, even in a joking way, you could still, you know, bring it up. Yeah, I don't even like to joke about it. Listen, I mean, like, listen, I mean, listen, if you're going to be a bad loser, that's me. I'm the poker bread. If you're going to be a bad loser, then you cannot be a bad winner. Right. So Antonio and I have hung out several times. Antonio and Daniel and I, like I said, we did an event together. And I mean, you know, we charge 50000 a day for events or something. So we were together in New York. I mean, they paid for all three of us, plus Scotty. And so there we are, you know, in New York, just having a good time, the three of us. Very pleasant. Uh, before they, when we showed up to the hotel, this amazing hotel for this amazing company, you know, uh, they weren't ready for us. They had, uh, I think they had uh, the guy who, uh, they had Theo Epstein speaking. And so the three of us, the four of us sat outside at this beautiful place in Connecticut drinking, you know, having a good time. Um, I couldn't drink. I had to be the MC. But they were drinking and the three of us just laughed and joked and had fun. I never once brought up the Antonio thing to him ever. I probably will never bring it up in my lifetime against him um, unless he's really cruel to me and I'll come use it as a comeback. 
And, uh, you know, at one time, Daniel and, and Antonio were laughing. I'm like, how the fuck did we let this guy beat us five times in a row? And they were both shaking their heads and laughing, you know, and that was kind of cute. But isn't that and perfect, Phil? Isn't that isn't that part of the beauty? You guys are all, all our friends. You guys all have love for each other. But at the end of the day, th they can rub you no matter what. You can always tap the table and say three and oh, and just walk away. Yeah, but I mean, that's not my style. You know, I, I, again, I'm the bad I'm the bad loser, not the bad winner. So this sand is pretty standard. I mean, I think I could have won a lot more, actually, considering the aggression I was showing. Um but the 11K has to call in the river. So I won an amount that I was always going to win, but I might have been able to check race the flop. Um, he's going to call, but then he might fold the river. I, Daniel's pretty smart. So, you know, these, these lines that some of the kids are using, like let's just play a big pot with the three kings. Daniel's a little too smart to go crazy with the five there, you know? Um, so I think I won it's possible I won the max. Otherwise, if I check raise, I might win 11K more and then, you know, check the turn and maybe could bet another 10K on the river, but pretty close to the max. Oh, I just hit the wrong button. There we go. Next hand. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's it's definitely been, it's been fantastic to watch others. I'm trying to get caught up on the question. So if I seem a little distracted, that's why. Um, but it, it has been cool to see all the interactions today in the chat of all the people just enjoying having you on the show and, and listening to you talk so passionately about the game, but also about the matches. And uh, I just wanted to sort of uh, tell that to you as well, um, because we are live in so many different places. The chat's hard to keep up with, but it is really cool to see. Um, question here from Danny. And this is a, this is a fun one. I'm just gonna throw one it more out. time. Look at Daniel. He just somehow knows the fours are good, but the, the, the five K was just such a milky bet. I figured I might get away with this, but I think he calls me if he has more time here. I think he's going to call that 5,000, but the time is running out and he and I both pay attention to the clock. It's up to 27 seconds and you're thinking I'm going to fold the old Daniel would have studied another minute and called me, I think. <laughs> so the, the clock worked to my favor there, but he kind of knew Daniel knew a lot of times when I was bluffing. Go ahead. You were going to ask a question. Yeah, a quick from Danny on Facebook. He says, Phil, if you could fill, fill a table with any players past or present to have a fun game, who would it be? I mean, you know, I mean, of course, I want to play with, you know, Jesus Christ and Buddha. And, you know, I mean, I want to play with the spiritual masters because wow. I just want to learn, you know. Um, so whoever those are uh, from all the religious leaders from the past, I want to play with all of them because what I would learn from them is priceless and would improve my life, not just poker, but on every single level. Wow. Now here I'm checking, Dan I'm trapping Daniel on the Jack eight deuce. I think I can bet and win this pot, but I decided to trap him and he studies just long enough where I'm wondering if he might have something, but and now the nine on the river and it just wasn't his strategy to make a lot of river bluffs. Uh, I had noticed and I already decided if he bets, I'm folding. And what did he bet? 10,000? Yeah, he bet pot. It was a good bet. And the minute he bet 10K, I'm done. I noticed when Daniel bet big, he had it. So I snap folded in Maria in the chat's like, I don't understand Phil and Ali. And they went on and on about, uh, I don't understand how Phil makes a decision to fold these hands so quickly when he should be studying and then call or raise with some of these hands when he should be folding, you know? And uh, it's all reading ability, guys. And so I was wrong, though. But I said, if Daniel comes out firing here, somehow he has six, seven, or he has me beat. I was wrong, but it was a quick, painless fold. Would you say Would you say that it's impossible for you to teach someone else the way you play? Because, you know, people like myself don't have that uh, reading ability. I, I can teach people, like, I'm very proud of my book, Play Poker Like the Pros. It teaches perfect, basic strategy. That's what play poker like the pros does. It also takes you on mental journeys and challenges you mentally to think outside the box. I even talk about in play poker like the pros, imagine you were not omniscient because omniscient means you also know what's coming, but imagine you knew what the whole cards were every time. How would you play? That's a fun thought exercise for people. And so I'm proud of that book. I really can take people a long ways, in perfect basic strategy, was a compliment for me when Nick Shulman, they always made fun of my Omaha Eight or Better chapter. And Nick says, all of a sudden, well, well, we all laughed at Phil, but all of a sudden all the solvers say that Phil Helm used Omaha Eight or Better strategy in his book is really good. And so, you know, I mean, 
I'm ahead of my time in a lot of ways and a lot of things. Right. And so, you know, um, so that's, that's one of the areas where, you know, I think people can improve by reading my book, play poker like the pros. Um, but can I teach heads up? Can I teach them to play exactly like I do? Uh, no, but actually I do teach in my book, play poker like the pros. If you have great reading ability, then I've shown you a pathway to greatness. It's there, but only you have to have great reading ability to get there. Likewise, so that's my book, Play Poker Like the Pros, which is a New York Times bestseller. Woohoo! That was a lifetime goal. Now, with Daniel, okay, I mean, with when it comes to heads up, limit, limit no limit, hold them, I can't teach people to play like me. Question coming in from Poker619 on Twitch. He says, uh, how does Phil see the future of poker? Does he believe that solvers will hurt the game? I mean, people have to understand there's the poker. Is, if, if you haven't learned, if you've learned from one thing from this match, you've learned there's artistry. You have no limit hold'em and you have math and no limit hold'em. Very important, right? And people can generally improve, right? But it's artistry. Joe Cata. One of the great young tournament players, you know, he has, he doesn't, he's not out there playing GTO, you know, he's playing his way, which is great artistry. And he's had an amazing run in these no limit hold'em tournaments at the world series in these huge fields. And I'm proud of Joe. And I think he's a very respectful guy. You know, he'll give me credit. I'll give him credit. I sometimes do wonder. I mean, like there are, there are some of the younger generation that's just, they don't understand. There's a very simple maxim. Give credit where credit is due. And I will give credit to these guys that are complete jerks to me. I'll still... But the game as a whole, do you think that it, it'll change because of all these new things that we're learning? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think as people... I mean, it's it's all about being a counterpuncher, right? Yeah, here's one where Daniel went a little, like a little... Got a little jiggy with fives here, you know, and I regret making a 10K there. I should have made it 15K um, or I should have called and then called his race. On the other hand, maybe it can't, would have come queen five deuce, Remco. Yeah. You know, <laughs> sometimes you look back and you say, I wish I would have got to the flop. No, I won the match enough, you know, like maybe it would have come five, six, seven, two hearts, a queen on the turn, you know what I mean? So you have to think in terms of, okay, this is good, you know. One, one thing I'm curious so, about, about too. You win, you win a lot. You win often and you win decisively in, in many spots. However, you know, you also care a lot about the, the public perception and the narrative that's attached to that. I, I've met your wife and, and then she's one of the most lovely people that I've ever met. Do you ever go on a, on a rant to her like that and where she goes, Phil, slow down. You know, you, you're, you're winning. It, that, that's, all that, that's all that matters. Yeah. No, I went on a rant. Uh, I went on a rant to her and, uh, and one or two other people who all said, Phil, relax, shut up. And I just said, I just can't believe everybody keeps picking these people over me. And I can't believe they think I'm a three to two underdog. Haven't I won 27 out of 29 matches against pros? How do they have me a three to two underdog every time? How do they have such little respect? But I understand intuitively. And I understand logically, they do not understand what I'm doing. And if you don't understand what I'm doing, then you can assume I'm bad. It's a stupid assumption, but you can assume I'm bad. And then, you know, you're going to pay for that. Now, I know that, you know, I know that Eric Seidel, I know that Antonio bet a lot of money on me, especially we're hanging out with Daniel, the three of us. Antonio bet a lot on me to win the next two matches against Daniel. And Antonio probably doesn't want me to talk about numbers, but he did really well because Antonio played against me and he understood. I don't know what Phil's doing, but he's playing great. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bet on the guy who just keeps winning to keep winning, and so I know those two pros backed me in a big way. Um, there were a bunch of other top pros. I think Phil Galfon bet several of my several times on me. Um, I think after the first match against Daniel, where I played my worst, some guys backed off betting me. They didn't understand that that of course I played my worst for the first half of that match, you know, um, which was fine. So, I mean, you know, Daniel, when he breaks down the first match and says Phil made a lot of mistakes, I was way off, you know, until, until I got low and then I woke up and I really played that 
in that first match that short stack perfectly and i played great from then on but here's one where uh this where one Daniel, uh, yeah this this one hurts a little bit uh you know i've basically flop i'm dead here yeah this is a massive cooler for for most people but you know daniel and i i mean the, I think I think if it were some other kids playing, they're going to raise and re-raise and just get all in here. Exactly. Daniel and I are like, we're not going to. Why would we get our money? And all we have is a pair and a straight draw, right? <laughs> let's just take it. Let's just take a card off. In fact, we both make a straight. We don't even bet the turn. That's how conservative we are. Check check. Now I'm checking behind because for two reasons. One, I want to trap him, and two, I don't want to get check raised if he has eight nine. You know. Now he checks again. Now I know that I have to bet. Um, I, what do I bet? Sixteen here or something? I'm betting enough where I don't want him to check raise me with just a four. And he might call with the seven. He calls. And he just says call. He doesn't even put the chips in. He's like, I call. <laughs> he's pretty sure he's not losing that pot because he knows I'm going to bet an eight or a nine high straight on the turn. And so, you know, actually, he, he, you know. It, it might there might some theories might say he could raise me big there. Uh, questions coming in, Phil. Are you superstitious? I like to say that I'm superstitious when it suits me. So if I wear a particular shirt, like the shirt I beat Daniel, that's at the bottom of my suitcase. Okay, that shirt's saved. And when a big tournament comes along that I think I can win, I will pull that shirt out. It'll be no limit hold because that's what I. You know, and it maybe even pulled out for the heads up matches, the, the 100K buy in. But so I've done it before where I wear a specific shirt and pants and I win a tournament and I put those aside. I set them in a separate place in my closet and say, all right, when you're fresh again in a week, you know, pull those out. I'm, I'm not a guy that smells bad. So, but I'll wear the same, the same shirt for four or five tournaments if I win with it. And I, and I seem to sometimes have won multiple times. Now, this is interesting. And pause it. So on the flop here, I'm thinking, Phil, you slow played too many draws, maybe. We were just talking about how when it came 6-5-3, how everybody moves in with 5-4 and 6-4. And I was thinking, you slow played too many draws. There was a hand where I had king jack of hearts that we didn't show where I should have probably raised, and I hit the heart right away. And, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, so is this the time to raise? And I'm debating that in my mind. And I'm like, you know what? You're probably going to miss anyway. So let's just call. Maybe you get a free card on the turn. So that decision not to raise won the tournament for me. Wow. Because obviously if I raise, he's going to fold 6-5 suited if I raise too much. And boom, there's the cooler card for him in eight. Now, the funny thing is um, I check. He's going to bet. I'm going to raise it up good. I'm going to make it like 30K because I think he's strong. But I need to protect my hand. There's, even though I have the flush draw, there's no sense for me to slow play this. He bets 12. I think I make it 30. When he moves in, I'm pretty certain he has a straight. And I'm just hoping it's not 10 jack. But I also have already made up my mind. Right now, I'm saying, okay, if I raise and he moves in, I'm going to call and I need a diamond maybe to win. But he'd also just re-raise. You saw with jacks and nines and a king jack nine board. So maybe he's going to re-raise me with a set or two pair. So I already kind of my mind made up when he moves in, I have to call and I'm just praying it's not 10 jack. And I'm so surprised when he stands up and basically says he's drawing dead. And then right away I call and I say I had a 10 high straight and he just like, he walks, he shakes my hand, which is saying I'm drawing dead. And I didn't see it. I mean, I'm really tired. It's been six. We, You guys are watched five and a half hours. We've been there seven hours straight or something six hour anyway I, I didn't realize that he had a 10 for a tie and so i shake his hand and then i just realize oh my god and i just i say it out loud i say oh my god you could tie with the 10 and he's like yeah so he had already shaken my hand if a 10 comes i mean i've read those stories in the masters where someone concedes you know and uh and i'm just thinking don't do that to me <laughs> you know i mean don't do that to me i already concede the match and and luckily it comes and the dealer's like, would you like me to count the chips? <laughs> Daniel's like, no, I know I'm covered. If Daniel wasn't 1000% sure I had him covered, he would have asked for a count, but he didn't. 
I mean, there it says $400,000 winner round three of high stakes duel back to back three rounds in a row, first against Antonio, then against Daniel. And now, as you alluded to earlier on the show, uh, we might have Tom Nguyen in the mix. We might have Phil Ivey in the mix. Uh, one thing we know for certain, Phil Hellmuth will be back inside the arena, inside the Focus Go studio. Negrano is out of challenges, but Phil will return here for another three in a row. Phil, that's, that's what I'm predicting, right? And I told Daniel, and if you run it back, I told Daniel, you're one of the all-time greats. You know? Yeah. I said that out loud. You're one of the all-time greats, Daniel. And because uh, he is one of the all-time greats. And I know this. And so, you know, he deserves credit. You know? Uh, he's making fun of my picture taking because, uh, leave, leave it pause there, but I've taken, th- I mean, I take thousands of pictures with the pens. Thousands. And uh, that's been my pose. There's one like, there's one with me and the Winklevoss twins where I'm exactly posed like that from a couple weeks ago when I went to the crypto conference in Miami. Um, and so, you know, I, I, all kinds of celebrity pictures with me, you know, in that pose and with anybody that comes up to me ever and asks for a picture, that's my pose. I figure it opens up my charisma a little bit, you know, the, the mouth and whatever. And so, you know, it was one hell of a battle and Daniel is one of the all time greats in poker. So, I only hope that someday he would recognize me as the same. Phil, I want to thank you so much for being on Run It Back. Hopefully, when the next series of rounds kicks off, we can do this again, do some more analysis, have some more questions from the chat. Uh, I want to thank everyone for watching, everyone in the chat right now. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel. I'll be back next week with more Run It Back. I'll have Phil back on the show later this year when he crushes Phil Ivey three in a row. I'm just going to I'm just gonna bet my money oh, on boy. that. Um, I, I can't wait to see um, when that's going to go down. Uh, Pokego Cup, coming up real soon. Phil, can we expect to see you at the studio? I am 100% planning on playing the Poker Go Cup. So I, I didn't know this. I mean, it was really weird. It was like three weeks ago. I didn't realize the online tournaments were on. But now I know I'm spending the whole month of July playing WSOPs. But you know what? I can play a World Poker Tour tournament. You know, I think it's July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd are the day ones. I can play that and be playing the WSOP at the same time. And I know that Daniel and I and a bunch of us will be playing both at once. We'll be in WSOP on the computer while we're playing in a WPT in person. Uh, looking forward to that. I love the World Poker Tour as well. And then and then the Poker Go Cup. Well, that's right at Aria. And Daniel and I have already talked about it. We're cleared to play on our devices. So we'll be playing in the Poker Go Cup tournaments, 10K, 25Ks, whatever they are. And at the same time, we'll be playing online. And so, you know, and that's really fun. And I mean, there might be a day for me I mean, there, there was a tournament, there was a year where I won two bracelets in the same day, one at like 6 a.m. and one at like 11 p.m., two different tournaments at the series. That was pretty cool. And so something really weird could happen where I make a poker go final table, right? And at the same time, I'm winning a WSOP bracelet. And that would be fun, you know. Poker go, we wrap the poker go at midnight or whatever, 11 p.m. Meanwhile, I'm chip leader in the WSOP with 30 left, you know and win a bracelet and then come back the next day, I'll probably be on no sleep and then win that. And so incredible things can happen when you give yourself a chance to let them happen. Phil, I can't wait for this. Thank you so much once again, you guys. Thanks for watching. This was Running Back. We'll catch you guys next week. Remco, I'm sorry if I was too cocky. I don't mean to to come that way. You know, right now I'm challenging everything in my life. Do I talk too much? You know, I'm a very normal person at this moment. So I I don't like getting that egotistical at this moment. Phil, the passion is what I care the most about, and you have so much of it, and I truly respect you and your game, and it's always a pleasure having you on the show. For now, good night. Have a good one, you guys. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next week. Remco, did I stay in the middle of the screen the whole time, or was I left?